Across the Park podcast is proud to be sponsored by Globe Gas and Heating. For the best kitchen and bathroom renovations, boiler servicing and repair, and central and underfloor heating in the Northwest, head over to globecentralheating.com and quote Across the Park for a free quote. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Pod Cafe Studios in the Baltic Quarter at Liverpool for the Across the Park podcast, episode 23 of season 23-24. And it's been a been a long season, but we're in the almost in the home street now, we're into March, and the, the business side of things needs to be dealt with, which we're going to talk all about that myself, Ian Mills, alongside Gary Judge. As always, um, before we do start, anyone who's got a social media account, some follows Kevin Campbell, will now be aware that Kevin has been been unwell for the past few weeks we, we were big friends of kevin he's come on the podcast a few times and all regular watchers and listeners will have enjoyed kevin so judgy me and you just want to start off by wishing kevin all the best don't we absolutely yeah as you, as you said then he's been a good friend of the podcast obviously <coughs> in, in recent times he's also been a, a massive supporter of the club publicly um mm. in terms of everything we've been going through con- condemning you know the the behavior of the ownership etc and, and backing the fans and all of the the, the campaigns that have gone on so yeah absolutely wish Kevin all the best I'm sure he'll be fighting fit very soon he's he's got so much um, determination generally in life mm. hasn't he and su- such a like a likeable guy yeah such a likeable guy with such a positive person as well I'm sure he'll be putting the most positive spin on it as he can and I'm sure he'll have a, a positive mindset to get himself back fit as soon as possible definitely everyone at across the park podcast and our followers we're, we're super kev campbell our big mate all, all the best get well soon big man we're recording this judge at 12 15 on wednesday the odds are that no one i look at 1 15 on wednesday the yeah. appeal outcome will be yeah. here and this podcast will be made redundant we will react as and when to what that happened whether it be an online podcast or not but this is dragging on. Oh, we've got we've got questions. Some of our listeners have, have voiced their opinion that it's dragging on. <coughs> I think Jamie Carragher was out saying last week saying this is dragging on. It's it's for Park Everton. It's not fair on Luton. They can't mm. plan the rest of their season. Not to go for us, can't plan the no. rest of their season. What do they need to do? How many points do they need to get? Well, I, I, do you make? Is there any sense of why this has taken so long? Because the decision that must have been made. Well, not not exactly, and, and not least. Um, <coughs> Not least the fact that they brought the hearing forward. We thought the hearing was going to be around the middle of February yeah. and then decision maybe the following week. They brought the hearing forward and then said, yeah, it's going to be the middle of February. It just adds to a, like a, the ongoing list, doesn't it, of inadequacies in mm-hmm. terms of the service they provide, the clubs. I've said it time and time again, that their job here is to uphold the competition, the values of the competition and, and the integrity of the competition. Every time something like this happens, i.e. it's delayed, they change, they move the goalposts, etc., it just brings more doubt as to the actual process and what's going on behind the scenes. Mm. As you say, I can't see how they haven't made the decision. You start to jump to conclusions and go, is that good news? Is it bad news? You know, everyone's, you know, the old saying, no news is, is good news. I don't know if that's the case here, because in this instance, as you've rightly said, no news <coughs> just is just further doubt and further, you know, uncertainty mm. as to what the, the short-term future of the club is within this league, what the medium to long-term future of the club is in terms of future sanctions. So it's just not fair. It's not fair on anyone, as you say, not just about Everton now, it's the other clubs. Um, and it's the general, you know, lack of in, lack of integrity from, from the Premier League once again. Yeah, look, we'll get on to... James Garner's comments, which I think are, I think this is adding to it. We get on to the, mm. the atmosphere of Goodison, which I think all this is adding to it. People are now starting to look into too much detail on Twitter. The same was Everton have really paraded the QC at the Tottenham game, in the picture of Silky outside the good, at Goodison Park and stuff. If Everton were in confidence of it, and I, we've heard that Everton did think it went mm. quite well. That that's only a rumor, of course. But people are looking at all sorts, refreshing Premier League websites to see if the ten points are going back on. Before there just yeah, seems yeah. to be me and you. That's what happened last time. Yeah, well, me and you, historically, when the club have deserved criticism on mm. communication, I've called the club out. Yeah. It's only right that we do this to the Premier League or, or, or the independent committee or whoever is uh, whoever does announce this. This, it's the, this it's, is it, just... You just said then it's the lack of comms, isn't it? Like, yeah. if you are going to delay it, delay it. Give us tell a date. People, tell people. You will hear on the yeah, 21st yeah. of February. Yeah. Just tell us. 
there's just no reason why that can't happen. There really isn't. Like, we both work for businesses, and I always try and compare football and football teams and football organisations to just general businesses. This would be inadequate at any level of, of, of life, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. In, in any professional environment. You know, if you're, you know, if you're, as a manager, conducting a, a review of someone's performance, if, you, if it's a disciplinary action that's going on, there's clear de- deadlines, there's clear dates that <laughs> you've got to adhere to on both sides. Why are they not being held to that same basic level? I'm not talking about elite level. We're talking like, mm-hmm. you know, the very basic levels of, you know, employment law or anything like that. We're part, and I've said it a, a few times, we're part of a multi-billion pound operation here you know and it's just being run like an absolute you know amateur sunday league show mm. it's awful it, it's it's absolutely it, and again as, as carragher <coughs> again uh, rightly said there's there's other teams you don't know now it, it, it's yeah. it's not well, it's affecting us and i'll look at us first and foremost how i feel how you feel how we feel if i was a forest fan if i was a, um, a luton fan well, just, just or a wolves fan I, I don't know either am i, am I club okay just on that one, and it's it's actually been um, broadcasted a lot more regularly on on Talk Sports since I was listening to Talk Sports on Sunday morning. I was in the car for a, half an hour or so, and Luton CEO was on there. Actually, got to where I was going and stayed in the car for an extra ten minutes because he was speaking so well mm. and so um, eloquently about the situation. And he just said, from our perspective, we we've got a league table all over our training grounds in the changing rooms, and it's got Everton with their ten points. Right, because we think that's the only way you can actually deal with it. That's just not right, is it? No. That is not right. However, I get that from a psychological point of view. And he was even saying, he said, we don't want to stay up on the basis of someone else losing points. That's just not the way we want to go about things. Mm. However, we've got we've obviously got to live in the real world. He, he was also saying that he, he thinks regardless <laughs> of where you stand on the guilt or level of guilt of Everton, he said the one thing that's wrong is the fact it hasn't been applied in the season it happened. That that yeah, is the yeah. minimum that should have happened, obviously for the other teams. But that's not. He was. He, he didn't go as far as to say this. But he said that's not Everton's fault. Mm. Like the league the haven't dealt thing, with it. Yeah, yeah. The league haven't dealt with it in that season. That's not Everton's fault, and therefore that that has a ripple effect. So whether the only thing I can think of, I'm going to try and be not like skeptical about it, but trying to think logically about it, is are the league starting to think what are the ramifications? From a you know from a mitigation a mitigation point of view for us, I mean, will Everton have the right to sue us if we've kind of not being quite, you know what I mean? So whether all that stuff around the demands for the minutes to come out, whether that's something buried within their kind of um, rules that the clubs have got a right to see that, you mm-hmm. know, whether that's something that I don't know. That's the only thing I'm thinking now is are the Premier League thinking if we don't get this right. Either Luton go after us, or you know Burnley and Leeds go after us for the previous season. There's all kinds of you know, and that could have been the case in the first instance. But whilst you've got an appeal process that's in place, you've still got that kind of you're still buying some time, aren't you? So yeah, we can course, change yeah. our minds a little bit here. <laughs> so it, it leads me to believe that they're still very much conflicted as to which side of the law that they're they're sitting on here, whether they're you know right to hand down this <laughs> sanction, and, and whether there's going to be a kickback from from the likes of Everton or other clubs mm. based on the decision they make. And the, the second punishment <clears throat> is on my mind. I know it's on your minds. It'll be on their minds as well. Like we're going to have to revisit this very, very shortly. This whole thing is about, if we don't get this right, I know. then we're going to have to go go through it all again. And, and, and do you know what? <clears throat> Everton are going to appeal it again. And I bet you're not going to force to appeal it. Yeah. And then, then what happens? We drag but, it into yeah, yeah. another season. And like, the whole thing, the whole thing, it's not made sense to me for a... I think to summarise this, some opposition fans who watch this and we talk to them all the time and they say they don't hear because the national media don't cover mm-hmm. it. <laughs> in layman's terms, Everton have been given a sporting sanction for a 19.5 million, which is argued by the club on the amount, but a 19.5 million pounds payment in, on interest on, on building a new stadium. That stadium does not bring revenue into this football club at the minute. Mm. We, we don't benefit from it and we're given a sporting mm. sanction. It's the light bulb I'm hoping mm. will go off with someone. We will move on, but... What's your gut feeling? Do we get something back? My gut feeling from the get-go, <clears throat> at the minute that we appealed and and the basis of our appeal was that we would be what I understand was the minimum, and I, I've I've read the guidelines and whatever the, whatever they're worth at this stage, the minimum 
points deduction seems to be six. Don't really understand where people are getting. I think we'll get five back or six back. I my understanding is the minimum points deduction you can get is six. There's no less than that. Okay. And on that basis, I believe that we'll get four back. I'm hoping further to your point around the next sanction, those four points, the basis of us getting those four points are related <coughs> to, okay, we accept your mitigation and therefore that mitigation should then apply to the next sanction and mean that that one is null and void. Hmm. Um, at this moment in time, I would take no points back but them accepting that the mitigation we put forward means that we only get one sanction and that's it. So that's double jeopardy. Yeah, they the, the wipe out that yeah. second sanction. I, I would take that at this moment in time. I know people are like, oh, that's not right. I, I get it. But, you know, I'm very much of the mind, you know, of the mindset generally in life is, look, you, you, you dealt that hand, let's just deal with it and let's get on with it rather than having something else lingering over and you know, mm. I'd rather just go right, that's it. We've took our medicine, as one of our red mates keeps saying, um, and let's just, just get on with things and, and control the controllables from here on in. Such is the game that we follow. <clears throat> 15 minutes in, I'm going to now talk football. Because that's, yeah. that's what Sorry, football... I'm going to say 15 minutes and, <clears throat> and I've just seen the appeal. I'll come then. <laughs> that, no, that, is just, that sums up where we are. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sick of it. We've got some questions here later on. I'll talk about it. Other fans feel, why is a football fan be looking at bottom lines and numbers? Yeah. Why have we got to that? But let's get to the football match on, on Monday night, Everton. Drew with Crystal Palace 1-1. All signs pointed towards an Everton win. Everton had to have Delisa Corey back. Crystal Palace were missing arguably three of their best four. players or four of their best players. They were going into it with an interim manager who, who was, you know, the new manager in the stand, but all the setup and the coaching preparation was done by an interim team, if you will. Everton did. 1-1. I, I didn't go. I had a bit of, bit of an injury. I couldn't go, so I watched it on telly. It sounded like the crowd were frustrated. Was it like that on the ground? Forget about the f- crowd for a minute because I know we're going to come on to that <coughs> with James Garner's comments. It was a dreadful performance. Mm-hmm. There's no t- dreadful performance by the manager, dreadful performance by the players who went out there, awful game plan, again, back to the manager, but awful execution of whatever game plan it was. It was a must-win game. It was a game that, given all of the the um, circumstances you, you laid out so perfectly then, it was a game that was just set up for us to win. Mm-hmm. Go and attack them, go and get at them. They're a vulnerable group of players. They're not sure what the new manager's going to do. They're, they're, they're unsure on so many levels. They had little to no midfield. Adam Wharton, 20-year-old from Blackburn, good player, but again, not accustomed to the league, was pretty much their only recognised centre midfielder in there. They had a makeshift couple of centre-backs, I would describe them as makeshift anyway, two donkeys up front who don't even belong in the Premier League. They were not a Premier League team, 11 mm. players that we've seen at Goodison. That should have been a, a routine victory. And we made hard work of it. We made hard work of it before the kickoff because I think the, the lineup was so negative. You're playing a 38 year old player who's played most of his last five or six seasons at fullback in one of the most advanced positions on the pitch. You're leaving out it for me, and I know he's a wide opinion. You're not a massive fan of him. One of our more creative players in Jack Harrison, who's busy, he's, you're taking him out the team. You, you know, the you're leaving Nana a Nana. You're leaving a Nana who, who is the only player in that midfield who, who looks. Like he's got a threat, you know. Obviously, Decore, we don't really class him as a midfielder. He's more like a forward. The only player out of the midfielders we've got who's capable of grabbing the game by the scruff of the neck and chipping in with a goal, you leave him on the bench. It was just a, it was just a bitterly disappointing. Even Ben Godfrey, look, I, I've got a lot of time for how, how he's come back into the team. He's shown character. He's, he's got no quality at all. He plays under Carlo at left back because we didn't really have a left back to speak of, or he was a. He was kind of tucking in more as a centre-back. He gets forward, he, he got a lot of endeavour. Again, very decent, brings a decent defender, brings a lot of physicality to that team. But he's not got an attacking bone in his body. He's not good enough to, to play in a home game where we we would be expected to dominate the ball and have more possession. Mm. You've got Seamus Coleman and, and Nathan Patterson, who, again, depending on what your opinion is, I don't care. Both of them are much better going forwards. Most, both of them are capable of producing something from the fullback area that could have been the difference. It was just a, a bitterly disappointing performance. So we're going to go on to the crowds in a minute. But I was in that crowd and I was so uninspired by the lineup, by the attitude, by the general mentality of the team. It was poor. You mentioned Ben Godfrey there, and, and I, I agree. His attacking quality isn't there, but it's funny because. 
around 60 minutes in, I think he made a charge run. forward, he yeah, tried, yeah. And it was him doing it. Yeah, like, yeah. Why, why is it on Ben Godfrey? Like, I understand that that was a Nathan Patterson because that would be mm. the instruction to bomb forward. But you can tell how Godfrey plays. He's told to sit back and let Michel- mm. Michelenko go forward. Yeah, God- yeah. Godfrey, you can see he's, he's told not to. I think he's tucked that into his own hands and gone, I want to run at them here. Yeah, There's yeah. no one else is doing it. Ashley Young, for me, that was one of the worst first halves I've seen anyone ever have. It was a terrible, terrible performance. But again, I, I, that's on the manager for me. He yeah. shouldn't be playing. And obviously, look, he's played poorly himself. So can't blame the manager for the, some of the poor touches he made and the decisions he made and, and what have you. But shouldn't have been on the pitch. Mm. It was avoidable. It was a thoroughly avoidable um, position. For, for for us to be in. Um, I was shocked second half when they came out the same. Could not believe it. Could not I, believe I, I it. I said, look, I watched it with my little lad and, and he, he said, I'm going to bring um, Onana on. Little boy's a massive Onana fan. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't think this manager does that. But then I'm thinking, if there's ever a, a case now to change it. Mm. And I actually said, do you know what? I think he'll put Onana on and he'll throw Lewis Dobbs in. Yeah, yeah. And that's what he did. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I actually said, do you know what? I think he'll put Onana on and he'll throw Lewis Dobbs on. Just to, sca- just to scare them and say, well, we'll do something different. And we started the same. Why? And then when they scored, oh. it, we brought this on ourselves. Yeah. And, and, I went, and it was so reactionary. And it's the one thing, and I've, I've made a lot of, I've compared him a lot of times to David Moyes. And that's both a compliment, yeah. but also a huge criticism. And David Moyes was another person who was very reactionary. He happily get through to the 80, 70th, 80th minute at nil nil, then throw three attackers on and just try and win it towards the end. Because you've got... I guess in his mind he was thinking it's less chance for the team to respond. We get away with a one nil win. Sounds, mm-hmm. but in games like that he would very very rarely. I think I probably count on one hand the amount of times he would make a change at half time. Very rarely do it. He was always wait to be on sixty minutes, seventy minutes. And I just come out and defended that in recent weeks to say, well look, I've chose that team because I think that team is the best team to get the job done. And therefore, why was it change it so early in the game? But did you not tell me that Anana? He's not a shoo-in in that team. <laughs> he's not. He, he, there's no way that he's not a shoo-in in that team. Uh, you know, Ghana, Ghana, Ghana guy was brilliant against Tottenham, you know, but against a, a team full of creative midfielders, players who drop into pockets, that was not Palace. All he was doing was playing back to front. There was no sense in having a defensive midfielder in there. That said, ironically, Ghana, guys come off and I, I was actually dropped into the pocket where a guy was and he scored. So Dyches probably thinks to himself, that's why he was there. You know, almost, I can imagine his own little brain ticking oh, over saying, I told you so. But, you know, and Arna's got the goal and, and the difference he made in terms of his presence is, is again, his attacking, attacking intent to pass forwards. James Garner was awful. Another yeah. player who was awful. However, I've got a bit of sympathy because he picks the ball up and he, he was passing sideways and backwards quite a lot. Uh, he absolutely was. However, you're looking forward and you're going, Calvert-Lewin's maybe showing a time to feet. Dwight McNeil was not on a lot of the time. I could see that from, from my position. Ghana guy standing behind you. You know, you've got Ashley Young, who was standing again in, in daft position. So there wasn't a forward pass on a lot of the time either. Mm. If you you had Harrison in there and you had an Anna who will step forwards into those pockets, you probably have more opportunities for him to pass forward. So he was poor, by the way. I'm not, I'm not defending that, but I think there was a bit of mitigation there. Uh, uh, it's certainly a reason why he, he, you know he maybe couldn't pass forwards as often as he's like to but again I can't I cannot think of any positives particularly in that first hour that came out of that game yeah it feels like with the world watching on Monday Night Football it was a chance for us to to win the game 3-0 and the crowd singing them off and yeah. so we're, we're still in this and we've done the instant match reaction after the Spurs game didn't we we, we said it was it was alive in there I mean with it, and it, mm. it it felt different we've got a question on um the booze. So just just park that for now. But the atmosphere, like I said, I wasn't there. What I couldn't go on Monday. Sounded flat. Was it like down the ground? Yeah, but it, uh, and I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm no, just saying no, was it, it, yeah. it was. It definitely was. <clears throat> but it, it's like that with any game. It, the crowds almost are looking for the players. Now, listen, when the players come out, it was just as Everton. You know what I mean? It was a yeah. decent booed the hand and stuff. But yeah, from, from the minute you know, we had a even a banner in the park ends that, that Sean's H one and stuff. So. Couldn't couldn't see the whole thing, but I had Sean Dyche's head <laughs> over me, so I know it was Sean Dyche, something something Sean Dyche related. So again, I think the plans fans played the part before the kick off. The minute a ball was kicked, we just looked like we weren't at the races, and I think that just feeds into the crowd. Again, it wasn't it wasn't the, the, the type of approach as the game. We weren't trying to be positive. I, you mentioned that run that Ben Godfrey 
made that didn't happen until the 65th 70th minute or whatever yeah. so there was such a lack of urgency from the players and that just fed into frustration in the crowd and look I, I don't I don't think necessarily the the booze at half time are conducive however I, I think that team deserved and the managers deserved to know that that was nowhere near good enough and I, was just, I think the fans are just hoping okay well you come into the second half wanting to get behind the team again I just continued yeah so I've got I was in the f- crowds. I'm not saying I was one of the ones who was booing. However, I wasn't, you know, wasn't condemning the booing because I think I think they were worthy of that. Yeah, we move on to that. But it was a, a frustrating night. Yeah, at Goodison Park, and one we need to move past very, very quickly. We'll talk about Brighton as well coming up. But talk about frustrating. Nothing more frustrating than trying to sell your home and get a nowhere. We have got a new sponsor called Tick Property Group. What is it, Judgey? Four nine five all in four hundred and ninety five yeah, pounds. The very cheapest uh, in the UK for February only. So if you are looking to get your house in the market, even if you are maybe not sure if you are going to do it March and April, get it done now. You won't pay another penny. So get cheapest over, on the UK market. Yeah, get over on our socials or get on the Google machine and Google Tick Property Group. A quick look at them now. Free valuation tick property group on Instagram. I said four nine five, and now that is four nine seven. <laughs> quote across the park. I'll give we'll, you two we'll, quid. We'll off. throw the extra two <laughs> quid in. Yeah. Up. False advertising. <laughs> Moving on to Brighton, Judgy. One of the best away performances I've ever seen an Everton team do was a Brighton mm. away last was, season. Yeah. It, it, it arguably kept us up without that. Oh, we it did, yeah. Gone. It did, yeah. Um, Brighton possibly. I know the Zerbies came out and said they're not found. They, they've not yet found a rhythm to Thursday Sunday. That mm. doesn't apply this week, but the. They seem a little bit at times. Kansas does get, get after Kansas because they've got the Thursday having the fo- after the Sunday. Yeah, so maybe they're playing maybe, after it. Yeah, maybe take that into account. But when I've seen, I've seen Brighton get some hardens this year. Mm. Uh, they, they, they seem that you can get at them. Um, the fact that we got at them last season. not as much at home, but yeah, they, they've they've looked at times a bit. Yeah, I, I just I just feel it's a game we can't lose now. I, I think with Luton's form, it, it's similar. It's a similar, you know, it's a similar position that we went into this game <laughs> in that time, wasn't it? Um, when we were saying, oh, it, it's it, it is it is one of them games that we have to see as a bonus if we got something from. However, it was a game that we almost couldn't afford to lose. Yeah. And as you say, we were just so clinical on that on that day. Uh, Decore was was instrumental in it, but I think you know generally the attacking players on the day, McNeil, McNeil, was, was, out, McNeil was outstanding. Yeah. Look at it, you know, with the two players you've just mentioned, in my opinion, and Arna and Harrison have got to come in for that game. I think they give us a lot more legs. I've actually seen a stat, a graphic that I put in the Everton group not so long ago that Anana's records are one of the fastest speeds over like whatever yeah. forty meters or something or twenty meters this season. So clearly, you know, you don't need you don't need to be a statistician to see that he gives us a lot more athleticism. He gets that team up and down the pitch a bit quicker. We're absolutely going to need that against Brighton. They're going to dominate the ball. We know that it is in that particular game as well. Mm-hmm. But we were so good at breaking and breaking at speed, and we've got players. With pace, Calvert Lewin, obviously we just mentioned Harrison and McNeil, maybe not considered the quickest, but Decore can get in there, you know, get in behind as can Anana. So we've got that's got, going to be our best chance. They've got to both come into the team. Um, I actually don't think, apart from that, despite what I've just said about Bang, Ben Godfrey, I would probably keep him in for Brighton. I think he it probably suits him this game he'll a little move bit you more. On there. I, I think you're right. Think I think so? he'll go to the defaults of bringing. I think now Onana and Takore, James Garner and Garner Guy are fit. I think he's got that dilemma that that the start of the season, the Adjusta Garner Guy, Onana Takore three at times looks disjointed and we wanted James mm. Garner in there. James Garner now has fell out of form. So I think that's an area that might have a little bit of a you know, he'd be scratching his head over how to approach it, but I think he'll put you right back. I, don't I think, think, I think James Garner will play. I, th- I think the main reason James Garner plays is, along with McNeil, they take the set pieces, don't they? And so does Garner it's guy a big come out pa- then? I think Guy comes out without without a doubt for me. Um, yeah, I, I can't see it. The only other potential tweak could be, or he could be a bit more defence-minded, which, again, wouldn't surprise me with Deitch, and, and certainly given the, the, the line-up that he played the other night, 
he might be tempted to leave Harrison out and put Garner, James Garner, onto the right hand side and put Nana alongside. I know it's not work, but again, you know, you, you think you're starting to think when you're picking a team, you're trying to think like the manager, aren't you? Yeah. And that's not the team I would pick, but it wouldn't surprise me to see Garner on the right and, and maybe, as you say, young. Young at right I think back. that I think to see that side with James Garner playing right wing, I, I think mm. the fans lost straight away. It it was like the first game of the season when we seen Michael Keane and Morpe, mm. and everyone went in there and thought, well, "Why yeah. are you playing the players who, who you shouldn't really be playing? James Garner should be playing forever." I don't mean that he shouldn't be. He's not a right winger. No, he's experimented not. with that. So <laughs> I hope he doesn't do that. One, sorry, one one person player we didn't mention, although you mentioned them briefly. I still can't believe that. Dobbin only ends up getting about five or six minutes or yeah. something the other night. That was that was scandalous. Yeah. Again, he's not a player. I'm not mentioning him for the a player that I think should be starting this game by any stretch. But I think given the the impact he has in Tottenham a few weeks back, he certainly is a player who should be getting more minutes in the home games. We're going to do a Brighton preview for the Brighton fan channel. We're just waiting on a, a time and a, and, a, and a date to do that. We didn't do a Crystal Palace one last week, unfortunately, because our, our friend D over at just the Palace podcast, Back of the Nest, he wasn't well. And then when he was well, I wasn't well. So unfortunately, we didn't do a Palace one. He's we are, good, we are, the Brighton lad. I remember him from last year. He is very, very good. good. <clears throat> so we will be doing a, a Brighton podcast, hopefully Thursday or Friday out for you. Um, some socials, Judgy, before we <clears throat> we get on with our Tuesdays and probably walk out to the appeal results. And this podcast becomes absolutely mm. redundant. Um, we've covered a f- we've covered this almost in full already, but we'll just just bottom foot. We'll full stop it really. David on Twitter. His opinion, Judgy, is, is that Dice for 12 games now hasn't got it right, which is the number of games Everton haven't, haven't won for. Um, why do you think he's so stubborn with his style of football? Surely games like Crystal Palace at home, especially with Luton's form, he can throw caution to the winds and at least play another attacker. Yeah, it, it, it's a trust thing, and he's, he's come out and said that, hasn't he? I'm not defending him here, by the way. I'm trying to answer the question in the best way that I can. The comments he's made where he's saying, look, I picked the team, in my opinion, the team I picked to start the game is the best team that could be on the, the pitch. Team trust in yeah, team exactly. to, to, the team I trust. Yeah, exactly. The team I trust and therefore I'm not just going to give up what we've done on the training pitch all, all week for 45 minutes. And there's an argument to that, but two teams playing a game, it's not just one, Sean. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so when, when the other team is counting on what you're trying to do or they're dealing with it very comfortably, surely that's where you go, I'm going to have plan to B. change it. Yeah, plan B. And again, like, again, David Moyes, he, he, he's a manager, it seems to me, who doesn't generally have a, a plan B. Um, but, um, and, and that's it. I think the one thing I would, uh, my but was going to be, he doesn't also have a lot of options either. Mm. Even 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 the other night, you know, we spoke with the two players who could have come on. We've mentioned uh, Lewis Dobbin as well, certainly could have changed things up. That said, I, w- I was one of the people who were saying at half-time, I wouldn't bring Dobbin at half-time. I've seen him come on at half-time, I think twice this season, and he, it's like it's too early for him. Yeah. You need the game to open up to bring Dobbin on. But you, you look beyond Dobbin, and possibly even going to give any, you know, more defences I think might be a half fit still on Arna maybe he wasn't quite 100% still maybe that's why he wasn't in from the start or earlier um, beyond that you haven't got a lot of options with, with Dan Juma out um, Gomez shown us a, a little bit of kind of a little bit of a ray of light didn't he when he came in for yeah. those few games and he scored that free kick against Palace you know it would be nice to have him as an option there isn't a lot a great deal of depth is there mm-hmm. uh, Beto we've seen and, he, and it, in fairness he's tried to put Beto up there but Calvin Luton has just not worked yeah. again the other night it just looked they just looked two strangers oh it's it's. I've never I mean it, that said we, we were talking after the game I was talking with Louis, Louis who sits next to me after the game and I was saying it, in, in, in fairness never really worked with Campbell and Ferguson did they you know the two big men mm. they're very similar players in terms of the, the areas they occupy and the things they want to do so it's not surprising. Yeah, that's a fair point. And, and you, you need players around. I think you need players around Calvert-Lewin to complement him. And I don't think a second strike is he. No, and, and, and that's that's what we didn't do enough. And that was the most obvious thing, regardless of personnel. I, I actually, and I know there's going to be a question on Calvert-Lewin, I actually think he played quite well the other night. You know, he had a very good chance of the Gladys Street with his head. No, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, do the, we'll yeah. skip to the question. Um <sighs> I put two polar opposites here. It was, it was crazy that we got two polar opposites. But it, that is Calvert Lewin, no, it, it is. is generally... And I think it's our fan base at times. Yeah. Um, first one, Sai on Twitter. He said he's not happy that Calvert Lewin is put as being battered by the fan base. Um, look, he's playing as a lone striker, but we don't even put wide players up there with him. Mm. Fair. And okay. the other tweet that came in, um, 
it was Carlos, and he's put, there's loads blaming Dice for this and his setup, but I'm not seeing it. If Calvert Lewin buries his chances, we win. It's always coming down to him lately. He's cost us massively, and the problem is we have no alternative. I'm more inclined to agree with the latter, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily agreeing that, you know, Dice is faultless here. However, you can't argue with, again, people like it or low with it, the XG stats generally stack up with league position. The one or not, we're one of the biggest... The, we're the worst. Yeah, we're the worst in terms of shot conversion. Yeah. The expected goals versus what we've actually produced. And if you look down the list of the players on that XG list, Calvert-Lewin should have nine goals. He's got three. <laughs> And I think we're eleven goals short, so it doesn't need you don't need to be a mathematician, and and you certainly don't need to be a, an expert analyst to see that he's having good chances mm-hmm. every game. And again, further to the the, the uh, followers' points around Deitch, Deitch is creating a system that's getting Dominic Calvert Lewin's chances. He's not taking the chances. I don't think the other night was a good example of that because I don't think he, he got half a chance a header, which was a difficult header at the park end. He would have liked to have hit the target, but from McNeil's cross, I think it was coming at him quite quickly. Uh, you know, if he scores that header, it's a great header. It's not like it's happening. Do you yeah. know what I mean? With the one at the Gladys, I think it was a little bit easier. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily call the other night a good example of Calvert Loon. It's the only reason why we're not winning. I actually thought he had a good game in general. I just thought there wasn't players close enough to him, which you know feeds back to the the point again that he's not getting enough support from the, from the wide players. But I, but I, I'm I'm very much in the camp of we would be in a much more comfortable position if Dominic Calvert was taking his chances. Mm-hmm. And I, I also agree with the fact that the biggest problem we've got is there's no one else really Beto like him or or dislike him, he's come in a few times and he's not been good enough. Mm. So that's definitely the biggest factor for me. Um, I don't know where to stand in terms of like saying, look, he's just, he, Deitch's decision to not play him or to play him is, is killing us. I don't know. I don't think you can really say that with any conviction that Beto should be coming in there. And if it's not Beto, who else is it? Well, the first the first tweet there from a side defender, I said he, he feels sorry for him. He's being on out a little bit, Lewin. No, I, I don't agree. I don't. I don't necessarily feel sorry for Lou. And I think from the start of most games, not like he's being booed when he comes out. It's just like it's oh, mm. and and the Reds are like that with with Nunes and Nunes. You've seen the stats that he's produced. He's actually creating more goals and, and all that. But yeah. you, you hear it when he misses a chance at Anfield, or certainly he had done before he started breaking or scoring a lot more. So. It's not uncommon for the fans to get frustrated when your striker is missing that many chances, particularly when your team's so short of goals. So I don't think he's being hard done by. I think, you know, going back to the Villa game where he's getting booed off when he's injured, that's hard, that's really harsh, and that's out of order, and we've said that. But I don't think particularly his treatment from the fans at the moment is out of order. He's, he's, He's a player who's there to score goals, and he's not scoring goals. So I don't think he he's immune from criticism. This was not so much a, a question. We we got tagged into a, a thread. There, there was a thread that started with um, James Garner's comments. James mm. Garner came out this week and said that it doesn't help that the Everton fans booed the team, that the Everton fans should stay behind the team, especially in play. Booing doesn't help. Yeah. That caused, as you can imagine, Absolutely. I pay my money. And yeah, someone yeah. else replies, goes, that doesn't entitle you to. And it yeah, caused yeah, that yeah, yeah. debate. But we got tagged in it. Um, Across the park podcast, what do you think? I'm of the opinion it's not helpful to boo your own team. This is bad, sorry. The only time I've ever booed an Everton team is when there's been lack of effort. Yes, there's lack of quality, but there's no there's no doubt that this group have lots of effort. Yeah, and that's what I said before. I'm not I'm not um I wasn't one of the people booing. I don't generally agree with it. However, I also couldn't with any conviction argue with the people who were who were booing because I know you, I get the argument Baz makes around lack of effort, etc. But these, we've seen these players are good enough. That's the point. We've seen mm. they're capable of producing. You, you me- the measure of you as a Premier League player versus the Championship and League One should be your consistency and your abil- ability to repeat performances and the, and the ability to play consistently well on most occasions and the ability to step up when we need you yeah. to, to perform. Too many players on that pitch on, on Monday did not perform to the level they're capable of. And they's are known that. That said, you know, I, I don't think for a, for a second that the booing is conducive. I don't think it helps the players. I think it makes them feel more, probably probably feel more like going into the shells than actually stepping up. And particularly, I've got a younger group than we've had in recent years. So I'm neither here or there with it. I don't agree with Baz that, that we, we that, you know, not booing, that we can't boo the team at all. 
Um, what do you make of James Garner coming out and saying it? Is it? Is I, it brave I said when I seen that. Idiotic? I said when I seen that. That's the words of the manager. Okay. I, I generally, I gen, genuinely think that this group of players don't talk out unless they know their managers in full agreements. That's just the way Sean's Zayt runs his dressing room. You know that. Um, so I, I, I get the impression that's something he's said or muttered or something that is generally you know being discussed in the camp. That's annoying that the fans are doing that. They shouldn't be doing that. Whether he's come and said, lads, look, he don't deserve to be booed. And that's something that he said, look, I think we need to... That, for me, sounds like the words of the manager. I'm not saying James Garner didn't believe it because no player likes to be booed. Yeah. So I think if they can encourage fans not to boo, they'll absolutely do that. Um, but that, that, to me, sounds like the words of the manager. The last question, and then we'll, we'll get on with things. Um, it's a bit of a backhanded compliment in here as well. So Joe on Twitter... He's put, how are you both feeling about everything? The ground seemed drained. The ground seemed fed up. I'm really feeling it. Now, you you both always come across really positive, do we? Wow, that's... Apparently, we're must very me, positive. That. Yeah, it must be you. <laughs> you always um, got a smile on your face, but I wouldn't say you're positive. It's, yeah, it's behind blue eyes, this one. Mm. Um, both come across really positive, but is it starting to get to you both as well? The Palace game for me... Pals were there for the taking, sorry. Luton are now winning every week. We've got the second punishment coming up, the appeal. I feel dejected. What say you, Judgy? How, how's the mood as an Evertonian? I mean, you, the, you started to feel a bit listen, drained. Listen, I, I think going back to the very start of the podcast, I think if you listen to the, the rant at the start of the podcast around how we're feeling about the the um, the lingering appeal that's going on and, and the lack of comms on it, the lack of clarity as to what's going to happen next, I don't think you can not feel drained. And again, that, the, the best point I can make is like, I just want it behind us so we can move on. Mm. I think I'd leave feel less strange if I just knew what was going to happen and we can just, again, in the words of one of our red mates, take our medicine and move on. We can't do that because it, it just seems like it's... I don't want to kind of pander to the whole corruption thing because I'm not saying that I'm not behind the fact that the Premier League have been corrupt to some extent. Just don't think corruption's maybe the right word. I just think it's inadequate. I think it's inept. It's all them things, but the impact of all that is that we as a fan base are just left just completely in the dark mm. and, and helpless. And you don't want to feel like that as a fans of club. You want to feel like you can contribute, going back to the question around the booing. That's what we want to be able to, to you know, influence on the game is go, well, let's get behind the players because they need us, et cetera, et cetera. And we've done that before, but it's gone on so long now that's just like... Come on, just just put us out of our misery or just give us something. The, some the second punishment for me is the one where I now know once team, this appeal outcome, this appeal outcome should allow everyone now to just get on with it. Yeah. But the second one's going to come. We've already been charged. I know. We're going to appeal it and it all starts again. I know. And, and uh, I, I said to you a, a few months back, if, if we get a second charge and it's proved that the club have done it twice, I'm done with the club. I don't mind. I said them was I'm done with this club. How can they be so stupid? To uh, not only so stupid, so negligent, and so um, so arrogant to bring the fans into it, to drag us into this fight with them, and then to do the same thing again uh, over the following year. It w- It'll be uh, interesting what the argument is. I, I I I'm personally of the belief that if if one three year cycle has caused a breach. You can't use that three. That you can't use that three-year cycle again. Mm. So you the, certainly can't use one of the three years, can exactly, you? Exactly. But so and, you and almost need to net that year and go. Now that one's out the way. Does that still put you in there? Exactly. So, so, so say the second breach at the twenty-one twenty-two season for, for argument. Say, say that's nineteen. And a half we should million. have been one hundred and five five million over three. Yeah, and then you add the nineteen point five on because you were you were yeah. over it. Forget the nineteen point. Yeah, exactly. Now. That should be zero. Exactly. That's just common sense, though, isn't yeah. it? And, and again, all of the question around, look, do you feel drained? I feel drained over the fact that people can't seem to see the most obvious solution to this and the most obvious way of approaching that second, second one. It's like, surely this can't be true. And, and maybe behind closed doors, maybe it's like there is a bit of acknowledgement there. And you, think, you know what? The things they're saying are right here, but how do we not look weak? I think there's so much of a concern mm-hmm. from them to not look weak. But again, trying to go back to address the, the, the question, I absolutely feel drained. I feel sick of talking about it. <laughs> it, it it's like... Our WhatsApp group is just... I know, I if, know. If you think we're positive, then you should come in our WhatsApp group and see what Judge deals with he wakes up. My rants. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not positive. If you could me. block one person in a WhatsApp group, I think Millsy would have been blocked by everyone. Yeah, I'd have I no mates. I'd have no mates at all. <laughs> but um, no, thanks for the... 
compliment Joe, but yeah, the positivity side of things is we try and be positive because um, we, we want the best for the football club. But me and Judgy are, are probably we're hating as much as, as any other fan. We might not rant and bang our hands and, and kick things anymore like we used to do. We try and maintain a bit more professionalism, but we absolutely care and are here and we'll do and anything on, we and, can and, to, to help the club. And you know what, exactly, I was going to say that. The one thing I will say in terms of the positivity, we're, we're conscious and we're, we're aware because of people within the club and obviously the, the fact that it's been said publicly, the club can't say nothing. Yeah. So I think we feel a bit of a duty to go, well, we've got a small audience here. We've maybe got a chance to reach people both within the club and outside of the club when we're talking to away fans, etc. So we've got a chance to, to to bang that drum, if you like. So I think we feel as we feel obligated to do that. Yeah. Well said. So keep watching the Across the Park podcast for more positive content that Joe <laughs> likes. Um, we have got a Brighton show coming out at the end of the week. And then I think the next home game... Um, I'm actually missing that. I'm, I'm, I'm West Ham, so Judge will be doing Again. the. I know, I'm a terrible fan. <laughs> the Again. comments are going to be loads of the yeah. Um So Judge will do the instant match reaction with someone, and then at the next home game, if if Liverpool don't get through the FA Cup, will be the Mazes Hard Derby, which any long term viewers and subscribers know that we are busy on Derby mm-hmm. Week, that the podcast started many years ago as a, as a, a city thing, so we do. Always go big on on the derby. There's lots coming up. We've got the seven 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 stuff. We've got the appeal. We've got the second charge. We've actually got football games. Believe it or not, football matches mm-hmm. to win as well that we can mm-hmm. hopefully talk about. Big thank you as always to our two main sponsors, Tech Property Group and Globe Gas and Heating. We've also got a brand new sponsor as well, which is the package has arrived. Judgy is let, let's not, let, hold on, an hold on. unboxing. Let's not we, call them a sponsor because I think I think that's unfair on on Globe and Tech. I would an say affiliate. they're an affiliate, yeah, they're an affiliate, and I don't want people to think we're just ramming things down the throats because the two sponsors we've got are, are, are not only, obviously, in the case of Ticker, they're a national property business, but they're mainly Merseyside, and we, we, we want our main sponsors to be Merseyside-based and, you know, yeah. proper businesses that are local. Um, this in this isn't. case, it's local, it depends how local... <laughs> it, it can be very local. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, anyone who's been a long t- long term fan, viewer, subscriber, will, will, will remember some of the amusing videos you used to have to put out uh, a certain affiliate and, and they're back on the scene. So We're back, we'll, we'll talk about them more next yeah. week, but um, welcome back to the podcast, our affiliate over at Manscaped. <laughs> These are going to be some good you adverts we do. These it. are going to be some good I'm adverts we do. Say, you've said it. No, let's go. They've sent us the stuff. We've got some. They gave us some nice codes as well. Yeah, some nice codes um, to, to give you some money off some of their say, products. But Judgy is, is going to be doing an unboxing. Which, which if I've, I've seen the rehearsal, it's going to be fantastic. As always, <laughs> thank you so much for watching and listening. If you Not are be watching, a naked unboxing. If you're watching, <laughs> click the bell underneath. Not that bell. The bell underneath the video, yeah. and it'll give you notifications every time we make a video. Like, share, and subscribe. As always, thank you, Toffees, and up the Toffees. <laughs>